Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. I really hope that we are all full of energy and very engaged in this conference. I'm extremely honored and happy to join you today. My name is Orlando Rojas. I come from UBC in Vancouver, Canada, and I'm director of the Value of Products Institute. In this condition, of course, I use uh, mainly bio-based materials and I have a small bias to uh, forest fibers, which I consider really ideal sustainable materials in non-wovens. And now the challenge is how to process those uh, uh, raw materials and they, the option here, of course, is wet laying, but I also will be discussing a little bit about foam forming and trying to compare those technologies also in the context of the fabrication of different uh, non-woven grades. I start uh, my conversation by taking a look at the global consumption of uh, uh, staple fibers for non-wovens and in 2018 you can appreciate the large uh, amount amounting to almost a 9 million tons of materials. Um, these fibers, of course, uh, have been used in dry laid, well laid, and air laid uh, short fiber non wovens, which take uh, the bulk of the material and represents a major increase compared to uh, five years uh, prior, amounting to 35%, with an estimated expected increase of 4% uh, per year in the next years. In, in the list of different materials that are used in staple fibers, of course, uh, polyester stands out as the most important uh, component. And uh, here, of course, most of it goes to the production of high entangled materials that are used in wipes, uh, single use or disposable end markets that also include uh, filtration, uh, surgical masks and gowns. So it's a very important sector, especially for the virgin polyester uh, raw materials. Now, if we think about the recycled polyester, then we need to then take a look at the vehicle sector where carpet, carpeting, trunk liners, and um, uh, for instance, uh, products for vibration, insulation, and noise insulation are uh, really the preferred ones. For instance, those uh, that are produced by needle punch uh, um, systems. Now, if we look at the bulk pulp production, wood pulp is only 16% uh, of the mat materials consumed, mostly by air laying of short fiber non wovens that are used as the core in adult uh, diapers and sanitary uh, products. On the other hand, regenerated cellulose like viscose staples are also used in wipes and medical uh, products industry, and both of these uh, segments are uh, growing equally uh, in this uh, sector of the non wovens among the materials that are used uh, for this uh, sort of uh, textiles, non-wovens, but also packaging materials that are the later, of course, representing uh, a major component, we have a huge production that, of course, will put some pressure as, well as, as far as waste management. This is because if we take a, a look at the figures and volumes in the EU, at least, of the waste generation, uh, one can appreciate that 60% of the total waste generated was represented by packaging materials, by plastics, plastic materials and others. This puts a pressure in landfilling and in landfilling, of course, uh, we can think about the effects of decomposition of the packaging materials. The, all the complex mixture of materials that can put uh, some uh, pressure in the CO2 that is emitted in the atmosphere. And what, it mean, what this means is that as a solution, we need to consider the option of reducing the use or the basis weight of those materials that are used in packaging and in textiles. Um, this, in the case of the wood fibers, is an interesting option given that there are many current technologies that are looking into reducing the basis weight while keeping the performance. And that implies, among others, the adoption of uh, new nanotechnologies, uh, including nanocellulosis. 
Of course, uh, wood fibers are also ideal for recycling, at least a uh, given number of times is uh, possible, and also composting, given that they are biodegradable and compostable materials. In general, for plastic in packaging, however, the major issue, as indicated earlier, is first the huge production volumes and the end of life of those materials that it, for the most part will end up in the landfill uh, here represented by 40% of the total. And that percent is um, uh, more worrying if we consider the fact that those materials have a very long life expectancy measurable in the hundreds of uh, thousands of years. Nevertheless, we use such materials for a very short time, uh, questions of uh, minutes. On the other hand, uh, a, a large volume of uh, the plastic in packaging also goes as a marine litter, representing a major environmental um, threat, but also uh, an economic uh, burden. Therefore, this is an additional consideration. The remaining will go on in incineration, as you see, 14% of the total. Only 14% of uh, the remaining, the balance, will go as a collection for recycling. And from this, a portion will go as losses during processing, as well as in cascading, that is, in the production of materials of uh, lower value applications. Only 2% will go in a closed loop uh, recycling to make similar or same materials. So here we can see that the material cycle really implies uh, the need for us to take a look at the end of life of the material and also to consider uh, with a closer look the recyclability of the materials. For this, we need to look at the molecular features of the polymers that are used in packagings and also in uh, textile products. And for that, we need to highlight that not all polymers are equal, of course, and not all polymers are created from the same source. So in this uh, well-known chart uh, with the four quadrants, we look into the biodegradability and also the source, whether bio-based or petroleum-based. And obviously, cellulose fibers together with PLA are both bio-based and biodegradable in the green square on the top right. On the other hand, conventional polymers, including those typically non-woven, PE, PP, and PET, are not um, biodegradable and are petroleum-based, but nevertheless are highly um, suitable for uh, recycling. And then we have the um, bio-based, but non-biodegradable polymers that are becoming sort of uh, trendy, including bio-P, bio-PP, and bio-PET, that yes, are bio-based, but are non-biodegradable, and being bio-based means that they require, um, in their processing, a lot of energy and a lot of uh, water uh, to bring them to uh, as an end product. And finally, Polymers that are being discussed in this conference, including PCL, uh, polycarbolactone, and polyvinyl alcohol, that are petroleum-based but are biodegradable. How they play in the context of the uh, retailers and consumers, okay, this is very clear. Mm, if we look at the bottom left, petroleum-based, non-biodegradable, as I said before, ideal for recycling, while those that are biodegradable and bio-based can be used uh, in given um, uh, end of products, for instance, those that are preferable single-use uh, products. But this makes uh, some retailers, as I said earlier, to consider this classification and text with an example. Nestle and others are looking into similar listing about the preferred materials and formats. And in the red list, you can observe here, for instance, the case of PLA, while in the green list, we have uh, polypropylene and PET, just because the fact of recyclability of the material, so provided we have a good uh, recycling culture, then this is really uh, um, a, a, a great prospect for this type of uh, materials. Now, in the case of non-wovens, of course, as, uh, as you know, 
in many cases, the lifetime of an unwoven is very short. We are talking about disposable materials and therefore consideration uh, to uh, biodegradable cellulose-based sources is uh, of high importance. For that same reason, we should take a look at the forest. And one concept that is uh, going around is that of the impact of substitution and transition. And I take here some figures from the EU literature where it has been calculated that 1% fossil fuel and plastic substitution by forest-based materials can represent a benefit of uh, 10 to 60 billion in euros in profit per year. So really, there is here an alternative that uh, we should consider. Of course, this doesn't come for free. There are challenges uh, that are inherent to the processing of uh, natural materials. But nevertheless, I think there is an opportunity that needs to be considered uh, deeper. The reason for such consideration is that intrinsically, lignocellulose, the, the fibers that we find in the forest that can be produced in a sustainable manner, in a regenerative way, those fibers are complex and functional. They are alive and therefore they are endowed with given features and functions that one can exploit if used as such in a, a structure like in a non-woven. They are interactive and that can be a plus or a minus, interactive for instance with water. And then they are hierarchical and multi-scale and that means that there are some uh, of the properties of the materials that can be exploited to uh, use these hierarchies and this is the case for instance of nanocellulosis. So the main principle here in the non-woven industry is to think about how we can exploit the inherent properties of uh, wood-based materials, forest-based uh, fibers that by themselves are strong, responsive, have a given chemical and thermal resistance, they are tunable and easy to modify, biodegradable, and overall they are sustainable. In this context, uh, one thing that has emerged quite strongly in the last years is the use of micro and nanocelluloses on the left, which is an area that is uh, uh, of great emphasis in my work, but also lignin, both fibers and particles, as well as, well as other uh, bio-based materials, including chitin, that can also be deconstructed in a similar fashion as is the case of uh, cellulosics into nanocrystals and nanofibers. So these are important components that I think can be uh, to some extent competitive and can produce a great impact in the no women's industry. Of course, price costs is a consideration. And here I put uh, the values for the manufacturing cost and minimum product uh, price of nanocellulose in the form of fibrils or crystals. Um, there is the literature in the bottom, but uh, main message is that uh, yes, uh, they have a cost structure that depends very much on the pulp that is used in the production, also depends on the energy. The costs are relatively higher compared to polyolefins, for instance, but I think they can be quite com competitive given the features that I have explained so far. And for, these, for these reasons that I have discussed, uh, including the inherent properties of fibers and also the adoption of nanotechnologies, uh, there is a clear trend and clear understanding in some countries, especially those that, that depend on the forest. And here I include uh, the uh, Finnish nation, but also Canada and Sweden and, and several others. And is this uh, idea of uh, looking into the future with a, with a shift uh, in the mindset with a paradigm shift as far as the material utilization and transitioning from the current forest products more into new value added products. And that includes, of course, uh, non-wovens. And the calculation here is that there is an economical uh, benefit to this that can be quantified. And the predictions are uh, a number of points in GDP and an increase in the number of exports and volume of exports. And this, of course, will go to different materials as those that are listed on the right, uh, including uh, replacing plastics, uh, resins, um, and building blocks, biocomposites, as well as wearables and non-wovens. 
So the basic uh, proposed idea here is to transition from a linear economy to a circular bioeconomy where both recyclability, biodegradability are considered. And the question is, what is the role of bio-based polymers? What is the role in our case in this context of cellulosic fibers? Can they replace all base materials? And this is, this is not an easy question. Uh, for instance, cellulose is a material that cannot be melted by using uh, heating, and, and that makes the processing quite different of typical materials. So here we are tied to the use of uh, water as a medium for processing uh, cellulosic fibers. Can we make new shapes, three-dimensional packaging materials? Can we endow new properties? All this depends very much on the ability for cellulose to be plasticized. However, this is a, this is a great challenge. Plasticized cellulose is uh, difficult because uh, fibers are in its, in them, by themselves a stiff materials. They are strong and stiff, and they cannot be processed by heating. So for that reason, as I had mentioned earlier, we need to do wet laying for the most part in order to put the structures together. Now, being different than a plastic, that means that they, can, uh, they cannot support uh, loads and any attempt to produce three-dimensional objects is going to find uh, that challenge. However, this has been overcome and in recent years, we have seen some developments with the addition of small amounts of even bio-based uh, materials that can increase the extensibility of the structure, in this case, up to uh, 30%. So this is an opportunity for uh, cellulose, cellulosic fibers, provided we can pro produce this type of uh, plastic effect. The other component is, of course, is in putting together the fibers, including nanofibers, the possibility to fine tune the structure as well as the physical and chemical features of the uh, web, whether paper, a film, or a non woven. And here I illustrate this by this uh, difference in the light transmission, really dependent on the intrinsic morphology of the building blocks of the non-woven or the paper. In this case, the aspect ratio of the fibers that are used to put together the structure will make a huge difference in the formation, in the density of the material, in the strength of the material, and also in the optical properties. So while this can be an issue, that is the variability of the uh, fiber sources as far as playing a role in the final product, I see this the other way around. Provided we have a good uh, fractionation uh, schemes, it is possible for us to tailor the properties of the material if we use in an intelligent way, the, in an intelligent manner, the different uh, sources that can be used to put uh, the material together in a non woven So in paper making, that is a conventional way laying process, we find the assembly of these fibers by using water and of course, uh, in the process, you are familiar with the wet end, the uh, press section, and the dry end, the drier section. In these um, uh, different sections of paper making, of course, we manage large volumes of water that is rain infiltration in pressing or, or evaporated. And for that reason, we're looking into ways to reduce the water consumption. And for that, the main idea is to replace a uh, great volume of the water by using air. And that brings us to foam lane. In foam lane, the question is, can we make the drainage faster? Can we provide the structure at the end with a better formation? So these are some of the questions that I will answer in the next uh, slides, where we look at foam forming of cellulosic uh, fibers as a, a substitute or, or as an alternative to the typical wet lane. Foam laying or foam forming is not a new technology. It has been around for many years in the case of uh, uh, wood fibers. Of course, in the no woven industry, it's a better known. But in the case in, uh, of paper making, uh, it dates back to the 70s. And since then, there has been a gap in the years, but uh, in the recent times, I think it has been re-evaluated. And now we can see already some uh, pilot units producing uh, foam form materials of, uh, uh, by using cellulosic fibers. 
The main, of course, idea here is to reduce the demands of energy and water and to maintain the physical properties. And then, of course, considering the different foaming agents that can be used and also the fiber types. Considering these last two aspects, I want to now uh, look into how a foam is produced. And of course, that requires a surfactant and surf surface active molecule. There are the different types of foams that are illustrated on the left. And basically, we need to stabilize air bubbles in a liquid, for instance, in this case, uh, water. And we can have wet foams when the uh, amount of uh, liquid is uh, dominant. But if we have the situation where we have mostly air, where the bubbles become non-spherical, rather polyhedral, that is when we have a gas volume of uh, greater than the 70%, then we are discussing about uh, uh, dry foams. For the most part, here we refer to um, liquid foams in the case of uh, foam forming. Considering liquid foams as a complex fluid, water, and then also air as the two distinctive phases. In the foam, the foam can be considered as a complex fluid that has a shear thinning behavior, where the viscosity, of course, depends on the air content, the number of bubbles, which behave as a, in a way as a rigid particles. And therefore, in the uh, gaps between the bubbles, we can find the liquid and for instance, eventually the fibers that I will explain later that will be constrained as far as the movement. If they were in water, of course, they would be more free to rotate. The rate of collisions uh, will also be high depending on the flow conditions. But the fibers tend to also flocculate and uh, separate by density. And that plays a role in the formation and the homogeneity of the structure. So in foam forming, we make a foam and that can be done by different procedures, air injection, by mixing, and also by chemical generation. But in this case, just by uh, agitation, by the steering, air is incorporated in the slurry that contains water, a surface active or foaming agent, and also in this case, the fibers. And then by using a, a mold, then the foam can be uh, deposited on a screen where the fibers will lay down and then the foam will be drained, especially the water and the surfactant, forming the non-woven at the end, as you see on the far right. So for the foaming agents, the surfactants that are used can be an ionic, cationic, amphoteric or uh, Switzerland ionic, as well as uh, non-ionics. And the next example that I will show will involve uh, the ones that uh, I list on the right, where we try to compare the different um, um, structure of the surfactant and, of course, the charge, whether negative, positive, non-ionic or um, amphoteric, that is, where both positive and negative charges are possible. So we were looking at the effect of these surfactants in foam forming, considering the two different types of fibers that we took as representative of two ends of the spectrum. On the left, we try mechanical fibers, thermomechanical pulp produced from uh, uh, spruce with a large uh, volume, large residual uh, lignin content, 27% of lignin content. These fibers are stiff and coarse compared to the ones on the right, the chemical fibers, bleach, pine, craft fibers that contain very little lignin, less than 1%, and of course are slender and much more uh, flexible and more collapsed compared to the stiffer mechanical fibers. And that, of course, will make a difference in the non-woven that will be produced from these uh, uh, forest-based uh, fibers. So looking at the structure after depositing these uh, uh, fibers in a foam suspension and letting dry, then we observe the case of the typical wet laid structures on the left, where we have or we observe the, the also the expected layer network structure of the fibers. So an in-plane um, structuring of the fibers. Now this is in a 
in a in a contrast with uh, the case of the form form non-wovens that typically show more out of plane um, structuring of the fibers, meaning that we have a more felted network, and that will play in the out of plane mechanical strength of the material and in the adhesion as well. So let's look at some results so that we get a feeling how all this can play together. For instance, if we look at the specific formation, the specific formation is a, an index that talks about the um, aerial distribution of a basis weight that is the homogeneity of the fibers, the variability in the grammage uh, of the fibers in the non-woven or in the paper. So the higher the specific formation, the poorer the formation or the poorer the uniformity of the fiber distribution. So we're looking here for low values of a specific formation representing better homogeneity of the fiber structure. And what you can see here is that in general, uh, for um, chemical fibers, uh, there is a small differentiation between wet laying and foam laying where foam laying appears to have a statistically consistent, better homogeneity in the formation, better formation compared to the wet laying process, especially again for chemical fibers. For mechanical fibers, uh, the differentiation is, uh, except for one hour layer, the differentiation is not that large. And in general, you can also appreciate that the type of surfactant, whether an ionic, cationic, non-ionic, or amphoteric, uh, don't seem to play um, doesn't seem to play a major role. What about the water removal? This is important when we talk about the um, savings that we can have in the use of water. And here we're measuring the water that remains in the structure in the web after pressing. And the basic concept here that you can take away is that in general, the wet lay um, fiber networks contain higher residual water compared to the foam lay materials. So here already we're seeing that there can be an opportunity for water saving if we use the foam forming technology. That would be the most important message here. And just as a reminder, this, uh, in this figure, we're using the um, apparent density of the structure. And we put the same surfactant types that I have used before uh, in the different symbols. And you can see that those uh, surfactant types are more or less clustered in uh, relatively similar areas, meaning that the surfactant type is not player is not playing a major role in differentiating in differentiation of the residual water. It is more the, um, the processing type and the fiber type that plays the most important role. Another component or another property that can be measured is that of uh, light scattering. And here we look into um, the different structures and it is noticeable and as expected that mechanical fibers produce non-wovens that have higher light scattering. And this is just by the simple um, explanation that uh, the mechanical fibers are stiffer, more rigid, and therefore they tend to have uh, more um, uh, poor interfaces, and therefore we produce higher scattering. And therefore, of course, as I will show next, the permeability will be quite different. So that would be the main point here. What about permeability? Here, the main thing that stands out is that the foam forming materials, regardless whether they are the chemical or the mechanical fibers, produce non wovens that have a higher air permeability. So all the transport properties will be enhanced as far as uh, air transfer in the case of foam forming. And that has to do with the light scattering results that I have shown earlier and the fact that we have a bulkier material uh, uh, um, that is produced. For the tensile strength and elongation, uh, I think we can discuss this figure in detail, but in general, what I want to say is that there is a small penalty in the property, in this mechanical property of the networks that are produced 
when we compare foam forming and uh, wet laying. Uh, the other aspect that stands out is the fact that it's known that the mechanical fibers will produce materials with lower strength compared to chemical fibers. And this is expected because of the bonding area, etc. etc. For the elongation, uh, we can see uh, related results, but the main point uh, at this stage that I want to make is that there is a small penalty that we need to pay as far as uh, tensile strength in this type of uh, systems. And on the other hand, the fact that the surfactant type doesn't seem to play a major role in differentiating the um, uh, properties of the material. Now, when we look at the Scott bond, uh, something similar should be said. Uh, the Scott bond is an out of plane adhesion of the structure that relates also to the filter structure of the network. But in general, once again, uh, the surfactant type doesn't seem to play a major role. It is a, the fiber type and the for, uh, forming process that will be the, the leading roles. So let's look more into foam forming. And so far, I think the main conclusions that we can draw from this evidence, experimental evidence, is that first we have or we produce networks, non-woven, that are more porous, have a better uniformity, and are also more permeable. On the other hand, in the process, compared to wet laying, we have a, a saving in water, and that implies uh, energy conservation. And then we have an out-of-plane organization of the structure that will predict a better resistance in compression. As far as the surfactant or the forming agent types, what we conclude is that there is a possibility for using other types of surfactants or forming agents, and that opens the window for bioactive uh, sources to be considered in this, um, in, in this space. And this is interesting because uh, many bio-based surfactants can be looked at and uh, uh, as having given functional properties that can really uh, boost the performance of the material in given applications. So for that reason, in this uh, brief discussion now that comes, I will refer to the case of the use of lignin. Lignin is another um, biopolymer that exists in the cell wall mainly of uh, fibers in wood. And in this case, lignin is known to have some certain surface activity. But to boost that activity, we have uh, done here a modification of lignin, the so-called carboxymethylation. And by doing this carboxymethylation, lignin molecules are produced in such a way that they lower, as I show on the right, the surface tension at a given concentration. So at a given degree of substitution, the lignin becomes surface active uh, molecules that can be also uh, excellent uh, forming agents. And that's what we use in the next step to demonstrate webs that were produced by foam forming using lignin as opposed to the synthetic surfactant that I illustrated earlier. So basically the same process that was shown earlier uh, was uh, conducted. Uh, foam forming on the left in a system that uses an inclined mold to produce the non-woven, then pressing and drying. And then the type of uh, uh, papers that are produced are those that are based on the fibers, in this case pine fibers on the left, in free of lignin. In this case, we use the wet laying process just with water, no foams. And on the right, Pine CML. CML stands for carboxymethylated lignin that was used as a foaming agent in a foam forming process. And now we want to compare the two networks that were produced, the two types of webs. So on the left, we have the wet laid material. On the right, the foam form uh, paper with pine fibers. And here really, we cannot uh, really see a differentiation in the structure of the fibers. Um, that was explained earlier in the case of um, the uh, mechanical and craft pulp fibers that, that were presented. 
Um, here, well, basically we have some structuring and as I explained earlier, the formation is expected to be better in the case of the foam laid material. What about the mechanical strength? Here we found an interesting result and is the fact that both the tensile strength and the Scott bond, the out of plane strength of the material was actually improved when we use uh, foam forming. And this has to do with the fact that these uh, type of fibers uh, were um, put together with a surface active agent, in this case lignin, that is a polymeric material that makes part of the structure and actually helps to bond the structure. So in this particular case, if we compare wet laying with foam forming, we can really conclude that the consideration of bio-based forming agents can be of interest as here we see the benefits of using lignin derivatives. From this, of course, then one can think about the production of different types of uh, non-woven for given applications. And uh, a particular example in a project in Finland uh, uh, with a, uh, under the name d uh, some companies have been a spin-off that now are looking into the production of acoustic planning, uh, panels using foam forming technologies based on cellulosic fibers, so quite interesting. Now, this foam forming, of course, can be considered in a, in a more piloting scale or demonstrating a, demonst demonstration scale or bigger, bigger scales and to the risk the process of uh, uh, forming of uh, natural fibers, in particular also here of uh, synthetic polymers in the No Women's Institute in the framework of a thesis that uh, Ben and myself uh, co-advise, uh, Mika, we look into this uh, process of foam forming using uh, the process that you see in the bead on the right. In this particular case, using uh, SDS surfactant and an ionic surfactant and polyester fibers. The process can then therefore can be made in a continuous fashion to produce non-wovens that replicate some of the properties that we saw before with the natural fibers. Particularly here we can see from the photos that the formation, if we compare wet laid material with foam laid, is better when we use a foam laid uh, system. So we have better formation and of course, as was also indicated earlier, less uh, water consumption, consumption together with a lower energy in the dispersion of the fibers. So this is very interesting because it's the foam forming process is not only suitable for natural fibers, but of course, as is already known by the no wovens industry, also by uh, different synthetic fibers that can be used with a given um, uh, densities or uh, given choices of um, characteristics, uh, especially uh, aspect ratio. And here, one of the things that uh, was noted is that uh, the system is actually flexible, quite flexible to accommodate different uh, morphologies or different aspect ratios of the fibers that are used. In such a way, and depending on, on the way the network is dry, it is possible to produce high bulk non-wovens, as the one shown here for polyesters, that could be used in insulation, acoustics, uh, padding and packaging, as well as in depth. Uh, filtration. This latter topic I will comment uh, next in the framework of uh, cellulosic fibers, but so far I wanted just to put the idea that uh, the conclusions that we drew for natural fibers can also be translated to synthetic fibers and this opens really major opportunities in the fabrication of uh, functional non-wovens as the ones that I have discussed so far. So this brings us to one example that I want to share. Uh, this is a very recent one during the pandemic, and we call this a can mask concept. Basically, the idea here was uh, working with my colleague, uh, Johan Foster, and also with the help of volunteers, we uh, became sensitive to the fact that uh, if we look around in the environment, uh, a lot of people have an uh, improper uh, disposal of the uh, polypropylene masks that are typical. Um, and that was really a, a, a major issue that uh, we thought need to be uh, considered. In fact, those masks are already creating a major pressure in the water treatment facilities. 
and of course that will translate and it's already translated into uh, also a negative impact in the marine environments. So the question here is in this type of disposable sort of plastic represented by PPE, whether there is an opportunity for natural fibers to play a role. And for that reason, we started to look into our own previous work in North Carolina, where we look into uh, wet lane and foam forming. And also the more, uh, more part of the work that was actually uh, produced early on in UBC related to also foam forming, but with a angle into the filtration and filtration performance. So here, something that that uh, emerged was actually the consideration of uh, form forming in the production of uh, filtering materials. And what not better example that the use of these approaches in the case of the design of um, surgical masks, for instance, uh, in the times of the pandemic. So we'll screen the different alternatives, uh, spend some time in the lab looking at different fibers. And of course, uh, there are infinite possibilities here as far as mixing the different components and using uh, different um, molds and uh, different compositions. But in any case, the main alternative here for consideration was, of course, uh, wood fibers that are biodegradable, that are also possible to put together to produce good filtration membranes and can be easy to wear. And for that, we did some prototyping where a mold was 3D printed with plastic. And then we use this to deposit the fibers on the mold, making a mask. And that mask is then one that can have given um, uh, functions and properties that combine the mm, fiber type and the formulation of the fiber slurry. In such a way, the masks are created in in, a, in, in, in so that a passive component is produced and that would be the, the most of the area of the mask while an active component or the filtration membrane makes part of the system and in this uh, filtration membrane of course we want to have good breathability but at the same time filtration efficiency and this all with the idea to implement this as a solution that can be scaled up in typical uh, systems for uh, produce, producing these uh, types of masks. And this is something that is now coming in the future. Now, this is of course a complex endeavor. If we consider, for instance, the pressure drop related to readability and the filtration efficiency as shown in this uh, diagram. Obviously here, mm, reaching the values of uh, N95 masks uh, that have very high filtration efficiency is a challenge. Especially if we target uh, non wovens and the non wovens here are in yellow symbols. And we compare those with knitted materials with wovens that are more or less materials that are considered as an improvised masks. And main point here is that the magnitude of uh, possibilities that can be put together as far as a material source the structure, the grammage that is used, and the chemistry. So this is a very interesting and challenging problem. But nevertheless, I think the idea of using uh, natural fibers for this purpose can be a very attractive one. So this was used as a demonstration, as a concept of the possibility of bio-based uh, products, natural fibers, taken from wood that can be then um, fine-tuned as far as the structure combined with the properties to produce given um, products that can find a use and a, a utility, especially during challenges like uh, the current ones. This also implies consideration of the diversity of uh, opportunities for bio-based polymers from plant sources, for instance, and proteins on the left and the staggering number of combinations that can exist as far as the building block types, the chemicals and the intermediaries. So this is a challenge, but uh, I, at the same time, I think it's an opportunity because we can fine tune the pathway to really optimize the process and have the ideal combination of materials for a given budget product. 
And here we need to keep in mind the case of uh, fibrillated cellulose, micro and nanocelluloses that are part of the cell wall of uh, plants that can be derived from different wood species or different plant species. And this can really be very helpful in fine tuning the properties of the um, products in the case of also non-woven could be an important consideration. Now, of course, we need to be conscious about the fact that some of the developments in no wovens in this area in general can be challenged uh, but given obstacles. And I would say that in the case of uh, bioresource materials, uh, wood fibers, they imply issues like financing, uh, regulatory aspects, the cost of the biomass and uh, challenges in entering the market. So these are things that needs to be considered in new materials that we predict will be more uh, common in the marketplace in the future years. For that, no wovens, of course, will play a very important role. And here I want to just end uh, showing a, um, a photo of a pilot unit in BTT that is actually making foam four materials from wood fibers that, as we have discussed, are recyclable, compostable, flushable, and renewable. And combining wood fibers with foam forming processes really creates an opportunity because we can gain some um, uh, benefits as well as water, as far as water utilization, energy utilization, as well as making competitive systems based on the properties of the materials that can be produced. With that, I'm ending my presentation. I acknowledge the different partners that have been interacting uh, with our group in these uh, efforts. And I put here a list of different recent papers that relate to this subject. And in red, I put uh, our collaborators that uh, have been very active and uh, I appreciate pretty much uh, the exchanges and, and great uh, collaboration that we have maintained over the years. With that, I end and I appreciate your attention. Thank you very much.